So have you all heard about this new live action Avatar show on Netflix? The one that's doing everything wrong? Uh, so far, it's been confirmed that they've removed Susan's Comet. There won't be a warm bossing say. Bing chilling. Aang apparently won't be as carefree. Aww. And Sokka won't be sexist. Well, hello. No. Because that was problematic. Wow, it's like they, they completely missed the point of his entire character arc and growth. Needless to say, we're somehow reliving history again. With another bad live action Avatar adaptation. And you better believe I'm going to be hate watching this show. Seriously, it's like Velma all over again. You all know what I'm talking about, right? We've all been there before. A terrible movie or show comes out and you check your social media feed to vent your frustrations and see what other people have to say about it. Then you feel vindicated and justify hating it when everybody else notices the same problems you do. Seeing everybody else being just as mad somehow makes you feel better. It's comforting to know that you're not alone in being disappointed at what could have been and pissed off at what we got. Sir, permission to leave the station. For what purpose, Master Chief? To give the Covenant back their bomb. Permission granted. Betrayed. Oh, this is not how this was supposed to go. If you've ever experienced something like this before, then you're already familiar with the effects of hate watching. We all do it to some extent, but everyone has a different reason for why they deliberately seek out movies and TV shows that make us angry. So, what is the real meaning of hate watching? As defined in Merriam Webster's dictionary, to hate watch is to, quote, to watch and take pleasure in laughing at or criticizing a disliked television show, movie, etc. End quote. Yes, it's actually defined in there as of 2008. Go figure, right? But working along these lines, there is a distinct difference between having a guilty pleasure show and hate watching. Guilty pleasure shows are shows or movies you know aren't good or that you're embarrassed of enjoying and would not admit to liking them publicly, but still have some love and admiration for them. A common examples of guilty pleasures are cheesy rom-coms, Michael Bay movies, or reality TV shows like 90 Day Fiance. How do you say kiss in Tagalog? Halik. Halik. Huh? May I halik you? Huh? They may not be the most critically well-received pieces of media, but people still find something to like about them that keeps them watching. It's visual junk food worth binging on. Hate watching is a different beast entirely. Sometimes a show or movie comes along that gains so much notoriety, so much press, so much vitriolic hate online for being bad and poorly made that people have to vent about their frustrations online. Hell, I've built a YouTube channel by participating in this activity. Also, Twitter has become a virtual town square for public humiliation, with users throwing their hottest takes of the day against crappy shows and bad movies that everyone seems to hate as much as they do. Which makes sense, as hate-watching is a highly social activity. A new episode premiere becomes another opportunity to live tweet your frustrations and anger towards a half-baked storyline or obnoxious love triangle. Plus, the chances to go viral with a funny reaction to a crappy season finale is that much higher. With so many other people watching the episode at the same time, the opportunity to strike a chord with others and make them laugh is that much easier. But what's the overall appeal of hate watching? Why do people do it? What exactly does a show or movie have to do so wrong that people seek it out on purpose to make fun of it? And why do we all like to gather around the TV to collectively cringe at the spectacle that plays before us? It's almost as bad as the collective cringe we all feel whenever we go to fill up with a gas pump. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that sucks. That's real hatred. 
Fortunately for us, Upside is here to help alleviate the pain of high prices. Upside is an app that helps you to earn cash back on day-to-day -day purchases. This is how it works. You download the free Upside app on the App Store or Google Play Store. When prompted by Upside, you can claim an offer and check in at the respective business the claim is related to. After checking in, you can choose which debit or credit card you use to pay with and then get cash back to your Upside account, which you can withdraw via bank transfer, PayPal, or an e-gift card. By doing so, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside than you would via a credit card's rewards program. This is a great way to save money, especially when it comes to filling up my gas tank for the week. Hell, I was able to get back $25 after filling up two tanks of gas, and I cashed it in for a gift card. Frequent users of Upside even make an average of $340 a year, so I highly recommend Upside. Download the free Upside app and be sure to redeem an offer today using the link in the video description. Oh, and by the way, did I mention that if we get 1,500 redeem offers, that we will be giving away a huge cash prize? If we accomplish our goal, we'll unlock a $7,500 cash giveaway. So let's redeem some offers, save some money, and give some money away. Go hit them up today. Now settle in and get comfortable as we discuss the many forms of hate watching. Personally, I feel that there are four major subsections to why people hate watch. Now, these certainly aren't the only reasons, but I do think that they're the most upfront statements I've noticed online. First off, there's people dunking on something that's incredibly popular and is getting a lot of hype despite its flaws. Whether it's good or bad attention, that word of mouth translates to publicity and builds up the momentum of other people wanting to check it out even further. To use a more recent and topical example, let's go with Hell of a Boss. Created by Vivzy Pop of Has Been Hotel fame, Hell of a Boss is a spin-off series taking place in the same location, Hell, but with a different plotline and cast of characters. Hell of a Boss has an incredibly high production value, especially for a YouTube release, and has gained a huge fan base because of the quality of the animation. But it's also received a heavy amount of criticism online with fans complaining about the writing, pacing issues, and not fully fleshing out all the characters by mostly focusing on a select few. If you're on animation YouTube or Twitter relatively often, chances are you've seen these video memes going around, making fun of the amount of swearing, sexual content, and vulgar humor in each episode. Now, whether this affects your enjoyment of the show is up for debate, but enough folks online seem to have the same problems with Hell of a Boss and they're making their opinions heard with snarky tweets and lengthy responses on other platforms like TikTok. There's quite a few YouTube channels who expand and dive into these issues as a notable part of their content, overanalyzing to the point of exhaustion. Vivzy Pop has been pretty vocal about her critics online, but has a fair piece of criticism for people who deliberately seek out media just to criticize it. You can always be critical and still love something and still accept what it was. You know, if, it, if there's something that you can't even enjoy, you just watch it to feel the bitterness and feel them and, and look for the mistakes. Just grow up. Following this example, we have our next subcategory. Viewers who used to be massive fans of a show that has taken a turn for the worse. I'm pouring one out for Game of Thrones fans. Instead, they hate watch the newer seasons to see how badly the series has nuked the fridge. They're usually fans who have a genuine passion and love for a show, but are frustrated with the direction it's gone in with no real signs of getting better. This can range from massive dips in quality due to bad writing, a show overstaying its welcome, scheduling problems, over-reliance on special effects, or an incompetent production. And yeah, probably the best known and most obvious example of this is HBO's Game of Thrones. It was one of the most popular shows in HBO's history, attracting the attention of casual viewers and hardcore fans alike. It had violence, politics, dragons, family feuds, and nudity. Just so much nudity. The show had a small fandom at first, but rapidly exploded in popularity. Word of mouth about the quality of the characters, costumes, and writing was just that good. That more viewers kept tuning in. I would know I was one of them. By season six, each new episode was routinely getting 25 million viewers per week. 
and that's just streaming and broadcast numbers. We're not even factoring in torrents or pirating sites. Including them, the seventh season alone had over 1 billion illegal downloads and streams as of September 3rd, 2017. And yes, that is billion with a B. However, these streaming numbers weren't a sign that the season was just that good. Mostly, it was that a lot of people don't have access to HBO or straight up just don't want to pay for it. Also, the show had gone completely off the rails. Game of Thrones was originally based on a fantasy book series by writer George R.R. R. Martin, but there was only enough source material to work with until season 5. From there, Martin was still writing the latest book, and st I think still is. Like He's been working on this since 2010. I'm expecting to see it completely finished by 2049, when the Blade Runners will finally come for me and end my suffering. Finally. I know it's real. Now, the showrunners tried to cobble together a new narrative before the series ending, expanding on what few bits of the story they had to work with in season six. It failed miserably in season seven and ultimately crashed into a fiery volcano in season eight. This left fans horrified and confused over what they just saw. Again, I would know I was one of them. The response to the final season itself was so bad that disappointed fans actually made a petition demanding a remake of the entire eighth season. The petition is still active, originally going live on May 9th, 2019, and currently has 1.8 million signatures. With 68 people signing it during the week I wrote this video. The fans have not forgotten, and they certainly have not forgiven the showrunners for what happened. I cannot think of another show that has fallen out of public favor as quickly or violently as Game of Thrones did. Now, they're attempting to bring it back with the prequel series, House of the Dragon, due to have its second season premiere this year. But their ratings have taken a substantial dip from the highs of the original series. Thirdly, there's casual hate watching. That's where someone watches a show, having no emotional investment in it, but hate watches it anyway out of anger and confusion. How can a show this poorly written and badly acted be so popular? How has it gotten renewed so many times when it's this awful and insulting? It's a piece of criticism that shows like The Big Bang Theory and 13 Reasons Why both get regularly. Viewers become irritated seeing the same issue pop up in the following seasons because those shows have found a lazy formula to stick to. Whatever the reason, viewers and fans can vent to each other about it online finding a sense of community and camaraderie and hating something so poorly made. Now, I find this type to be a good motivator when you're having trouble being creative, like really utilizing that rage to power through and make something you're proud of. We all have moments of self-doubt and creative burnout, but apparently the writers of Riverdale don't and put out direct like this anyway. Trying out for sports. Not me. I dropped out in the fourth grade to run drugs to support my nano. Huh? That means you haven't known the triumphs and defeats, the epic highs and lows of high school football. But you will. What the f is happening right now? And fourth, there is ironic hate watching. Watching a movie or show that you know is badly made, but having fun ridiculing it anyway. Movies and shows considered so bad it's good generally fall into this category. Now, one of the most famous and earliest examples of this is the TV show Mystery Science Theater 3000. The premise follows a man stuck in space who is forced to watch cheesy B-movies with his robot companions. They talk during the film in silhouette, making fun of the actors and creating their own inside jokes to deal with tolerating a bad movie. So, what started off as a public access show in Minnesota became a phenomenon. Its success led to their own movie, Netflix spinoff series, and riff tracks, a playable commentary track for modern blockbusters. Going along with this final format, there's films like The Room by Tommy Wiseau, One Weird Guy's Vanity Project with bad writing, a breast cancer subplot that never comes up again, and a distracting amount of awkward sex scenes. <laughs> Mine. Yeah, right. 
Oh, I just don't like that. Mom! He released it sincerely in 2003, but later discovered it had a ton of ironic fans. They loved it as a midnight movie full of inside jokes and group participation. The Room now has the reputation of being the Citizen Kane of bad movies. It became this generation's Rocky Horror Picture Show, only with none of the irony or campy sensibilities. It's an odd sensation to go into a movie with no previous information and find out just how badly made it is. Where the real question becomes, do you leave the theater? Or to try and find some redeeming factor from the experience by making fun of it. You may have wasted your time on a film that didn't deserve it, but was the experience still entertaining? But as my major focus on this channel is animation, it's time we get into the massive problems with hate watching in, you guessed it, animation. Since I do my best to stay on the pulse of new releases coming out, I generally rely on Twitter for first impressions and what's on the horizon. Also because I hate how much I'm on there because it's a festering hellhole of despair. Frequently, it seemed like there's a massive divide between excitement and dread for new animated shows coming out. Now, let's not forget that My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, became a phenomenon partially due to hate watching. Back in 2010, people on 4chan started posting about watching it ironically, for being excessively girly and silly. But a lot of them gradually started to like the show for its writing, fun characters, and catchy musical numbers. Pony posting got to be such an issue on 4chan that the founder and head moderator, Moot himself, banned posts relating to it until they eventually made a board specifically for talking about the show. They were even behind some of the first widespread inside jokes like derpy hooves and naming male fans bronies. I can't believe I'm talking about bronies in my video in 2024, what is going on? Now, it might have started off as wanting to dunk on a series intended for girls, but the quality of the show beat out their own low expectations, which I guess is a win if you can ignore uh, <laughs> a lot of the uh, weirder and more unsavory parts of the fandom. Animation fans in general seem to be more particularly harsh critics when it comes to new shows. I think there's a few reasons for this, some more fair and impartial than others. People who love animation tend to have high expectations and standards for what's worthy of spending their time enjoying, but I think it's mainly because they know the amount of time and attention that goes into creating a show or movie from start to finish. Most animated productions, whether they're shows or movies, have a longer production time than a standard live action movie. They tend to have more moving parts from concept to production, and animation is inherently a time-consuming process. I don't think it's a wrong assumption to believe an animated show will be more carefully constructed and smartly written, given the development time. But when a show is doomed from the start, or has a very messy development, fans will also be the first to know when something goes awry. This was the situation for High Guardian Spice a fantasy magical girl series produced by Crunchyroll. The show itself is an LGBT plus friendly show, featuring teenage girls with spice themed names going to some magical academy. But the show had several caveats, notably a low budget that led to some corners being cut regarding the art and writing. Are these issues obvious? Uh, yeah, I'd say they're pretty tough to ignore. But more importantly, they led to a massive wave of hate watching from folks online. A gay friendly show about girls going to a magic academy is a cool concept and has been done well with other shows. But it being included on a streaming platform like Crunchyroll sent anime fans reeling and review bombing to no end. They disliked the character designs which veered too far off of the standard look of Japanese anime. High Guardian Spies had a troubled production from the start, with little communication coming out directly from Crunchyroll regarding missed deadlines and a premiere date that kept getting pushed back with no notice. This has been a consistent issue for Crunchyroll as a company, with a lot of users arguing the money used for original programming would have been better used for necessary interface updates and licensing fees. I've used it before, and yeah, it's still pretty janky. High Guardian Spice's premiere wasn't helped by the, uh, <laughs> a discourse between outspoken members of the crew arguing with haters on Twitter defending their show. 
it became the latest show to dunk on, with people disparaging everything they knew would get them clicks and engagement. We have more inside information into a production than ever before due to social media. When a show has production delays or a film gets canceled, we can genuinely find out why almost immediately. Or if a show is continuing on despite bad reviews and viewership, we can vent our frustrations to each other and try to make sense of weird business deals. Now, has hate watching ever been used to do good or mobilize action to make a property better? In some cases, yes, but getting there was incredibly messy. After the first trailer for the Sonic the Hedgehog movie, viewers were blessed with ugly Sonic and a wave of memes came out dunking on the awful design. With a property as popular and influential as Sonic, the filmmakers wisely listened to the criticism and redid Sonic's model to look more like his video game counterpart. It was a very public mess up to be sure. But the movie and its sequel went on to become massive hits for Paramount, grossing $319 million and $405 million respectively. Otherwise, there's the case of a spin-off of a previously popular series that missed the mark on capturing what made the original series so special. And one of the most jarring examples of this is the 2016 Powerpuff Girls reboot, a series notably produced without its original creator, Craig McCracken or the original voice actors for that matter. But the most negative criticisms of the reboot stemmed around their choice of comedy. The witty and clever jokes of the original had been replaced with dated memes and twerking. Yes, twerking. Following this, there was the My Little Pony Make Your Mark series. It was the eagerly anticipated fifth generation of our favorite tiny horse show. And honestly, the movie was pretty decent. But the quality of the show itself that followed is lacking, with many fans complaining about the janky animation and uninspired writing. Both of these shows had big shoes to fill, but it doesn't seem like they had enough going for them to stand on their own feet. Yeah, hating a show and venting about its weaknesses to others online is one thing, but what are the lasting effects of engaging in hate watching? And how do people take it too far? Now, I think there's a real danger to the effects of hate watching, and social media exacerbates every aspect of it. Hate watching has a real bandwagon effect. A bunch of people all vent about a show like Velma being trash and cringy online. And then other folks, who otherwise would not have bothered with the show, watch it out of curiosity. That increase in streams makes the show seem more popular than it actually is. Unfortunately, we're currently living in an age of media consumption being highly politicized. People are routinely conditioned to make their politics of paramount importance online. You can't just agree to disagree anymore. Now it's become personal. And the media landscape has been increasingly tailored towards this, appealing to two sides of the spectrum. As a result, Velma was accused of being a rage bait series meaning a show deliberately engineered to piss off people by being offensive, inflammatory, and having an upfront agenda. Their decision to race swap Velma, Daphne, and Shaggy, oh, I'm sorry, I mean Norval, to match their voice actors made sense, but irritated longtime fans who saw it as performative wokeness. But they were more upset at taking a beloved children's IP, removing the dog it's named after, and butchering the characters into smug, unlikable know-it-alls. But a property like Velma was realistically already bound to be renewed for an additional season for several factors. It's an adult-oriented, animated meta-comedy starring a well-known comedian, anchored to a popular and highly marketable franchise as a streaming exclusive for HBO Max. It had every advantage you could get from a network and still managed to suck as a TV show. Now, I don't think hate watching directly caused Velma and other bad shows like it to be renewed, but those streaming numbers are all what the network actually care about. People can hate on a show online all they want, but takedown videos and snarky tweets are all still the kind of engagement they're looking for. It means the rage bait aspects are working. In this attention-based economy, they're still creating a conversation, even if it's full of anger and disgust. 
If you're looking for something diving further into how an actually kind of decent show ended up so bad, I'd highly recommend checking out this video about the rise and fall of Glee by Mike the Snare. It's an hour long recap combining both hate watching and constructive criticism. As goofy and nonsensical as the humor can be, Mike frames much of his arguments over how Glee was lightning in a bottle, became a massive franchise, and why it fell off so hard. That's the core appeal of hate watching to me. A community sharing their disappointment and anger over a piece of media that wasted their time or squandered an opportunity. Building up that kind of discourse still creates hype, which leads to more people watching it to see for themselves. And that kind of online dialogue would make the network less likely to cancel it, even if people don't like it. Tons of streaming services pile on all the raw sewage runoff their servers can handle. But it doesn't mean we should reward them by watching it. At least not if you actually want the show to get canceled. Numbers don't understand irony. So any sizable engagement from viewers will indicate that the network should and probably will renew the show. I wanted to look closer into the subject to figure out why hate watching can be so addictive. How does something so illogical become a fun pastime for people? Now I did some digging and found a few possible solutions. From the obvious to the unusual. There's a brain chemistry component to why hate watching can be so enjoyable. According to this Forbes article by Mark Travers, hate watching feels more justified than just disliking something. Quote, when we see a show that we truly hate, it's more personal. We're also overcome with stronger negative moral emotions when faced with hated things. So the show feels almost offensive to us. We keep watching media that offends our moral character so that we can take action. End quote. Now, I wouldn't say watching Chip Chilla activated my flight or fight response exactly. Well, not until Rob Schneider showed up at least. Why are you running? Why are you running? But seeing them deliver toxic messages geared towards children really did piss me off. It goes to demonstrate how a copycat show managed to completely screw up the most important aspect to include giving good parenting advice. They forgot to make a funny, memorable show and just ended up making an annoying, preachy one with less staying power than its rival from Down Under. Like, it wasn't bad enough that Chip Chilla was produced by Bent Key, a children's streaming service created and funded by punchable nerd Ben Shapiro. The service itself was deliberately launched on the same date as Disney's 100th anniversary to counteract Disney's supposed attempts to, quote, push all the worst excesses of the woke left, end quote. <laughs> Man, is this all about the horsey ride episode where Bandit and Stripe pretend to be horses getting married by the kids? Fellas, is it gay to be imaginative and playful with your children? I, I don't think so, but what do I know? Bluey succeeded where they did not because their writers are substantially better and more nuanced at delivering an entertaining story with hard and positive life lessons. It's that contrast of something being done so well with the right crew and how it can turn into a train wreck without those kinds of barriers put into place. Look, while doing a massive binge of the Land Before Time TV series for my upcoming review, watching those episodes pretty quickly turned into nearly 10 hours of hate watching and torture too. Now, I don't generally seek out to hate watch a lot of things, outside of what I review on here, that is. But I knew what I was getting into with that show. I was exhausted at how flat and repetitive the messages are, how Sarah never learns anything, and the irritating songs that add nothing to the story. Sinking 10 hours into a lost cause like that really made me realize I mostly hated the waste of potential they had to make something better. And I was frustrated because of how quickly it felt like they tried nothing and were all out of ideas. But being able to vent about it during the stream did make me feel better because everybody else could share in these same frustrations that I did. By the way, be sure to keep an eye out for that Land Before Time video. It is going to be a big one. Whew, I am putting my all into it. Now, hate watching can be one of the most obsessive forms of fandom. It takes a serious amount of time and attention to actively seek out every minute flaw in a show you allegedly don't like. 
but fixating on that level of detail is notable. If someone truly hated the show and could not stand it, they would change the channel or shut off the video in the instant. But there's the train wreck appeal of hate watching a show that draws us into it. Even if it's not something we genuinely would seek out, we want to know where the story is going and how much worse it could get. There's also the risk of taking that same level of nitpicking and negativity into the real world. It might be fun to be hypercritical of a show in your own home, but carrying that same energy into a conversation ranting about work or a bad interaction with a friend can be dicey. It's not good coworker talk, all right? Just stick with the coworker memes. It can also make you a nightmare to be around if you always see the worst in everything. Most people vent about negativity online as a release to make the rest of their day more tolerable. But it does not mean they want to be around it all the time. But the real danger lies in bridging the gap from being a fan into taking your anger out on the creators and the crew on a public forum. Hate watching something is not an excuse to make targeted attacks on creators, artists, and actors. I still remember how awful the aftermath was of people criticizing Kelly Marie Tran for portraying Rose in The Last Jedi. You don't have to like the movie or the script, but she was hired specifically for acting in a role, and her performance was not the issue. Bullying an actress online because you did not like her character in the Space Wizard movie is insanely childish and cruel. People are way too comfortable being casually crappy and insulting to creators online. Getting blocked by somebody notable is not the win you think it is. But there's no sugarcoating it. Negativity does well on the internet. We're talking substantially better than positivity, even though I know that's a cynical and depressing thing to say. But it's true, and I have the numbers to prove it. Most of the videos I release that focus on negativity perform way better than my positive videos. Like that Rise of the TMNT video, my Lilo and Stitch video, the Over the Garden Wall video, I talk about things I like a fraction of the views. But the things that are like, look at this bad AI, look at this bad, dumb movie, those do great. Now, subject matter may have something to do with it, but I'm not totally convinced. People have a burning curiosity to discover the chaos and destruction behind a bad film or TV show. They're after the drama and rocky circumstances that led to things falling apart. Drama videos do incredibly well on YouTube because folks cannot get enough tea, especially if it's involving someone they're familiar with. Now, I wish I could get a better response from the positive videos I've made. But I know that people get more of a dopamine rush seeking out things that will make them angry or let them laugh at something for being bad. That's because anger is a motivator. It spurs activity, outrage, and compels us to demand answers. Most of my best received videos from last year indicate this too. Because negativity has this curiosity factor involved. It makes people want to share with others. Even other content creators are acutely aware of this. I guess I'd call him a colleague, but you got like the shiny crab guy, Shea Furless, creates amazing long form videos ranking every single film from a major studio. But guess how he does it? He structures it from worst to best deliberately. That is a good strategy to first hook your attention and showcase the worst tendencies of a studio. As the video progresses, you get a better sense of insight into what makes their best movie stand out along with these same brand hallmarks you've gotten used to. That's the way to hate watch responsibly to me. Give us a reason to care and want a studio to do better, even when their flaws are very apparent. Straight up hating something without genuine constructive criticism is boring and lazy. I say if you're going to devote that much time to watching and hating on something, at least find some ways to salvage a reasonable message from it. Like, uh, say, maybe write a video essay on it. That's what I'm doing. But until then, I await the shitstorm that's going to be Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix and season two of Velma, because as much as uh, hate watching can be crazy, <laughs> it is a hell of a lot of fun to watch. Just, you know, bring constructive criticism. Like for example, Velma, you might want to put the dog back in the show, you know, Scooby is kind of important to the Scooby-Doo franchise.